right? Welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Deuteronomy 20, the laws of warfare. You know, war can be brutal and very ugly at times, but as long as evil exists in this world, war is at times a necessity. But even though at times it is a necessity, we can't just uh, wage war at any time we want. There must be a just cause. And even when there is a just cause, there are, there are laws that govern warfare. And if we want to be successful as a nation, we must follow them. We must follow them. You know, and one of the interesting laws that we're going to talk about is a law that prohibits um, a nation, a Christian nation, from forcing people into the military from forcing people to go to war. Yes, that's right. If somebody was too afraid to go and fight, to go off to war, they, they were not forced to go. They were not forced to go. And one of the spiritual lessons we're going to learn from this is that God never forces anyone, anyone, Christian or non-Christian, to fight for him, to fight for the truth. He only wants volunteers. He wants those who have a, have a yearning desire to serve and to, and to fight for the truth. And, um, you know, if someone doesn't want to fight and they say they're a Christian, well, they're not going to have any, re any rewards. They're not going to partake in the spoils. They're not going to be, they're not going to be uh, proud of what they had accomplished. And they're not going to stand with that group of overcomers in Revelation chapter 15 who who get to sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb after having conquered the beast and his image and, and the mark and, and so on. But anyways, let's get right into this, um, these laws of warfare. But um, if you want, uh, please turn with me to um, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. We'll start there. But before we begin, let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray for wisdom and understanding in your word. Help us understand these laws of warfare and help us uh, learn how to, how to um, even apply them in this war that we fight in today as Christians, in this great spiritual conflict. Um, and we pray that you can um, condition us, strengthen us, give us courage for the times ahead. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, tw uh, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, again, the laws of warfare. Um, when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou and, oh, he says, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. Don't be scared. It doesn't matter how many they are. You know, today we are so outnumbered. If you're a Christian who studies your Bible and believes in God's law, as well as all of the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're, you're not in the majority. We are in the minority. We're even in the minority among those who claim to be Christians. But you know what the good news is? God gives us a command here. A command right from the commander-in-chief. He says, do not be afraid of them. I don't care how many of them there are. Have courage. That's important because we are moving into some perilous times. And it's going to look like, like, um, like there's nothing we can do as far as uh, having uh, the tactical advantage, so to speak, in the spiritual sense. Because we don't have the, um, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the tools that our enemy has. He says, Do not be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so one of the first commands is to, uh, to not be afraid, to be courageous, but also uh, to remember that God is with us. That God is with us. You know, um, it says here, brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. This is a reminder that our Lord is our commander-in-chief. That Almighty God is our deliverer. 
He is the one that gives us the victory in battle. Not man, not great numbers, not just our own, you know, um, uh, uh, military tactics and skills and so forth. Now I'm taking this both on a fleshly level as well as a spiritual level. But it's God who ultimately gives us the victory. It's not the strength of our own arm. It's not the ability of our own gifts and talents. It's Almighty God. That's the key to victory. Is to put your trust in Him. You know, um, in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 8, God says, hey, if you follow my commandments and you do things my way, 100 of you shall put 10,000 to flight. In other words, you only need 100 to defeat 10,000 enemies. And the numbers get even better than that. In uh, Deuteronomy, um, tw uh, Deuteronomy 32 verse 30, which we'll get into um, here in the coming weeks, God says that one shall chase a thousand. Just one of you as an individual shall be able to uh, conquer 1,000 of your enemies. And two shall put 10,000 to flight. Think about that. The point is, is numbers mean absolutely nothing if God is with you. So when we get into those perilous times and, everybody, and all the ungodly are surrounding us, persecuting us, criticizing us, trying to take away our guns and whatever, trying to tell us we can't worship God, do not be afraid, for God is with us. He will give us the victory. Hey, Revelation chapter 15 um, documents it, that we get the victory, that we will overcome if we have faith in Almighty God because it's a future account of us, the overcomers, standing there, singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, singing our victory songs. And... Um, um, I think uh, another interesting verse with, as far as um, this uh, principle of warfare, this law of warfare of uh, God giving us the victory, is uh, taught in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 as well, where, where uh, basically Paul states that if God be with you, who can be against you? Who can, not, who can conquer you? No one can. And um, here we go. Well, let me just state something. God's not going to use great numbers of people to achieve the victory. He's ne he never has. In the history you had in, in Judges chapter 7, out of the entire nation of Israel, God chose just 300 men and Gideon to defeat 135,000 of the enemy. Think about that. In Revelation chapter 12, God is only going to use a small remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ to conquer and defeat the beast system itself. Of course, along with God's help and his angels and the, and the seals, trumpets, and vials, the plagues. But God's going to give us the victory. It doesn't take great numbers. In fact, great numbers will not Hear the truth. We'll never be able to convert great numbers in this age, but we, but we are supposed to try. We're supposed to sound the alarm, to give the warning, but ultimately the battle will come down to, to just a few. When I say few, I mean few as compared to the world. I don't mean just a few, but to a small group of people who are dedicated, who love the Lord, who are willing to fight for the truth, not just saying they're willing, but willing to pay a price for it. Willing to take up their cross. Verse 2, And it shall be when you are come nigh unto the battle that the priests shall approach and speak unto the people. He's going to give a pre-battle speech. And this is what it is. And he shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. And do not tremble. 
Neither be terrified because of them. Do not be scared. That is the lesson we have today. The media will try and scare us nonstop all day long. Even, uh, even, um, even commentaries that we like to listen to on the radio sometimes will put fear into us because they're just telling us all these bad things that are happening. Hey, put your trust in God. We know these times are coming. Bad times are coming. It's, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be an easy war. And even though God told the people not to be afraid, it didn't mean that there were not going to be any casualties, that there weren't going to be any hard, strenuous times. But that's what tests our soul. That's what tests uh, our metal. It tests to see what we're made of. Verse 4 for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. It's God who does the fighting. It's God who ultimately gives us the victory. Oh yes, we're supposed to fight. We're supposed to go we're supposed to war daily. But ultimately he's the one that gives us the victory. And you know what's fascinating? In Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Almighty God does do this again in the battle of Haman Gog. When all the armies of, uh, of uh, Gog, of, um, with the chief prince of Meshech or the chief prince of Moscow, leads this host, um, probably uh, Russia and China and other nations, come against America, the land uh, where, the, where the true descendants of Israel live. Not over in Palestine, but the nation of Israel, which is America today, those Christian nations of the world, um, God is going to rain down fire and brimstone upon our enemies. As they come over in their great uh, clouds of uh, planes and ships and whatever else, God's going to defend us. He's going to protect our borders. And it's going to be an amazing sight. Ezekiel 38 and 39, the battle of Haman Gog. Verse 5, And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying... Now, this is interesting. The next few verses here are going to give us um, exemptions for warfare. Now, it wasn't just all... Um, all the exemptions weren't just for you know someone who was fearful and faint-hearted. Faint -hearted. There are other uh, just causes... Um, for, for people not to have to go to war. Now, I must state that in uh, Numbers chapter 1, the age of the warrior was from 20 years old and upward. They were males. There weren't females that, that fought in the combat, uh, combat arm, so to speak. God's law commands that only the men from 20 years old and older. That's what his law states. Anyways, but uh, even, even after that, there are exemptions for warfare. Verse 5, And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man dedicate it. Now, this is, this is kind of interesting here. It's, God says, Hey, if somebody just built a new house... Um, let him, let him go and dedicate it. Let him go and dedicate it. Let him enjoy his house for a while before, um, before, uh, sending him off to war. This, this lets us know that, um, the family was important to God. The stability of the nation, the very structure of a nation is its family. So family business at times would take precedence over, um, the, uh, over the warfare. Interesting. Verse 6, And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in battle and another man eat of it. Okay, another example where, hey, if somebody just, just plant, just, you know, just got their, um, just made a vineyard here or just planted a vineyard, um, let him enjoy the fruits of it before sending him off to war. Because uh, this was strenuous labor to, uh, to plant a vineyard 
And, um, well, verse 7. What man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Somebody who just got engaged and they're about to get married. Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. So another exemption from warfare would be if someone someone's engaged. Um, they would not be required to go and fight. Um, let me just mention this for a second. These three things, a new house, a new vineyard, and, a, uh, and uh, getting ready to get married. These things are all things that, um, you know, if somebody put all this time into building a house or planting a vineyard or is excited about getting married, their mind isn't going to be right. Um, most often to go to battle, to go off to war, because they're going to be sitting there on the front lines thinking about their, thinking about their um, virgin bride or their bride-to-be. And um, they're going to be worried and, you know, thinking about things. Hey, uh, they're going to be worried about somebody else taking her or marrying her and, and so forth. And it's just not a good thing. These laws provide that only those who have the mindset and no distractions should go off to war, should go fight in the battle. Now, in the spiritual sense, think about this. These are those who um, uh, do not have the cares of this life to worry about, to hold them back. That's what it takes to be a warrior. You have to be dedicated. You have to be focused. You can't be distracted by the things of this world and be successful in battle. Hey, if, if you're worrying and... and and stressing out about the cares of this life and not focusing in on your mission as a Christian, you may do more harm than good. And in a physical battle, hey, if somebody's sitting there daydreaming about their new house while on the front lines, they could get their buddy killed next to them. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. And the lesson, again, the lesson for us as Christians is God wants only focused and dedicated soldiers fighting in his army, doing his service. Um, verse 8, And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that, here's the other exemption, the fourth exemption, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. You know, it's amazing there. God says, hey, send, send, send the fearful and the faint-hearted home. We call them cowards today. It wasn't an exemption that made them... Uh, the other exemptions were, were worthy, noteworthy, but this is just someone who's, who's a coward. Send them home. They don't have to fight because if we keep cowards in the army, God's saying, if you have them with you on the front lines, they're going to get everybody else scared. And it's going to be a chain reaction and it's going to work as like a cancer in the army. No, again, God wants only the faithful and the courageous. Fighting for him both in the physical sense as well as in the army of a Christian nation. As well as in the spiritual sense. God doesn't want a bunch of cowards worrying about every little thing and, and always worrying about their self and, and you know, what am I going to, uh, uh, you know, have to um, keep me warm and comfortable? No, God wants those who are willing to go through the harshness of this life and who can keep their focus and not be scared to fight for him. This is an important law. Because there's going to be a cutoff point. Not everybody who claims to be a Christian today is going to participate in the battle we're fighting. They're not going to be victorious against the beast of Revelation 13. Only the faithful and the courageous will. Again, read that in Revelation chapter 15. Did you know that every... that the main lesson Christ gave to the churches... In Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 was encouragement to overcome. 
encouragement to have faith, to have courage, to make it unto the end. In Daniel chapter um, 12, it states, Blessed are those who make it unto the 1335th day. That's not just making it or living to that time. That's making it through those 1335 days of trial, of tribulation, of hardship. Verse 9, And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. Okay, an army must have leadership. And um, that's part of the laws of warfare. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. Now, these are important laws here. Again, like I said in the introduction, e even if there was a um, just cause to make war against a nation or a city, there still are, there still are laws that govern um, the method of attack, so to speak, or the uh, time of attack. And that first one is that you must hold out the olive branch to them. You must, you must proclaim peace. You must give them a chance, in other words, to repent. You must say, hey, this is where you've wronged us. Um, we can have peace if you repent of this and follow these circumstances in verse 11. And it shall be, if it make uh, the answer of peace and open up unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. In other words, you're going to exact a tax from them. They're going to pay. They're still going to pay for the wrong they did to you. They're not going to get off scot-free. But at least they'll get off with their lives. And at least they'll be spared uh, bloodshed and heartache and, and the loss of life. So that's important. Even when somebody wrongs us, there is a time to give them a chance to make it right. But if they don't... Now, I'm going to say something. In the book of Revelation, God's going to wage total war against this earth, against the nations of this world, uh, against the nations of this world. You know, a lot of people think that Jesus Christ was a pacifist. No, he wasn't. Yeah, sure, he came during the first advent as a lamb. But he comes back at the second advent as a lion. He's both the lion and the lamb, or the lamb and the lion. He was the lamb slain when he came here and died upon the cross. But he's coming back as a roaring mighty lion. I believe it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 10 where he puts his foot on the earth and he's got the scroll in his hand that was sealed with seven seals and he roars like a mighty lion ready to devour the prey in battle. Where was I going with this? Well, God in the book of Revelation even gives people a chance to repent step by step. But when they don't, then the battle is on and they will receive everything they've got coming to them and justice will be served. Verse 12, But if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And, and this is after... Um, now a lot of people say, well, we can't do surprise attacks, and that's not true. If you make, if you ha if you give them a chance to uh, sign a peace treaty and uh, follow these uh, circumstances here to be tributaries unto you to pay the tax to pay, you know to uh, to do that, then you can say, hey, okay, at any time, we are in a state of war, and I can attack you at any time now, and you can make a surprise attack. Anyways, verse 13, but, but the offer of peace must first be offered. Verse 13, and when, and I'm, I'm going to state this too, that propaganda should not be used in warfare. That's a, that's false witness. 
It's a violation of the commandments. And um, yeah, sure, we can use covert activity in times of war and things like that, but not, you cannot um, unjustly mischaracterize your enemy even. Think about that. That's serious. You can't over-exaggerate about the wrongs they did because war is part of the legal process in God's overall plan. And you can't, uh, you can't uh, defame your enemy by sending off a bunch of propaganda that's not true about them. Because that would, in, at times, um, make grounds for unjust wars. Um, well, enough said on that. And, um, okay, so in verse 12, it says, If it shall make no peace with thee, then thou shalt make war, and thou shalt besiege it. Verse 13, And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, when he's given you the victory, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. Okay, all males at this time were to be, if a battle was to be waged, they were to be eliminated. Um, at a certain city. But uh, the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. You know, a lot of people joke around about, um, you know, when America goes to war, we never take anything from anybody. We never take spoils. And a lot of times we actually give things back to them. And um, anyways, but God's law actually permitted spoiled to be taken from the enemies. Hey, if they wronged you and they caused you to go to war, hey, it's your right, your legal right to take um, the spoil for, for to, to, pay, to pay your troops, to pay the costs of war, to pay all the costs that uh, it costs to go to war. Um, and that was just. But they were not to harm the little ones or the cattle um, or anything like that. But verse 15, Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. When he says the cities of these nations, he's referring to the nations of the seventh chapter of this book. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and so forth. Um, those are people that were so beyond, um, they had every chance to repent. There was no more grace to be extended to them. They were to be utterly annihilated for many reasons because they were so uh, steeped into filth beyond repair. Plus, they were infiltrated with the, with the DNA of the Nephilim. And uh, that had to be uh, put in... Put it, God wanted to put an end to that, to those um, hybrid, half-angel, half-human um, um, beings that still existed. Verse 16, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, um, thou shalt leave nothing, thou shalt leave, save alive nothing that breathes. This, hey, this is pretty extreme. And a lot of people mock God's word because of this. But they do not understand the justice of God. They do not understand God's plan. For they do not understand how filthy beyond repair these people have become. Hey, if God let, if God told the Israelites to let these people remain, it would have been like a cancer, a disease that lived in their nation to, to uh, pollute them right after they get the victory. That didn't make any sense whatsoever. We've already talked about this in prior chapters, so if you're new to coming into this, uh, new to studying with us, do some of our prior studies. And uh, there's Deuteronomy chapter 7 that we did. Go back and read about that. And you'll find out a little bit more of why God wanted this to happen. Um, as far as the command to, des to destroy every, every living thing among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Presites. Verse 17, But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. That's, that's pretty severe. This is what people call genocide today. 
But, um, you know, the world is so much more that they're so, they're so self-righteous. When it comes to, when it comes to uh, them thinking they're right and accusing God of being unjust. Hey, God does everything justly. It's just that people don't understand his justice at times because they don't seek it out. They don't try to understand. It's much better to try to understand God rather than to accuse him. Because you're going to lose if you're going to accuse him. Verse 18, why did he want this done? That they teach you not to do after their abominations. Do you know that homosexuality is an abomination? And yet it's being um, glorified as something, uh, something great and courageous as an alternative lifestyle in America today? Yes, we're still falling after the abominations of these nations, for that's one of the sins they had committed there. All kinds of sexual immorality and depravity, namely that of homosexuality. One of the chief sins of a nation, one of the sins that brings God's judgment down upon a people. And yet we have Christian churches today that say, oh, it's, you know, they deserve to be able to marry each other if they love each other. What's wrong with you? Have you never studied God's word? Wake up. How can there be even one Christian in America that condones this, that gives their hand to it? which they have done unto their gods, so should you sin against the Lord your God. God says, hey, wipe them completely out. Zero tolerance. God had a zero tolerance policy towards evil, towards false gods in the nation. Beloved, that's why we're, that's why we're suffering today in America. People say, oh, isn't it wonderful that the, that the uh, uh, First Amendment gives us the freedom of religion. Yeah, it is if we were all, if it was freedom of Christian denomination. That is wonderful. That's what it was intended to be for. But when, it's, when it uh, gives sanctuary to, to evil, we've allowed a cancer to build in our midst. And it's been the, the Achilles, um, uh, it's been the, um, the Achilles heel of America. To invite in and celebrate all these false religions. That it's it's suicidal. It's suicidal. The reason why God doesn't want these other religions, other gods in here, he says, because they will teach you to do after them. But what about free will? Hey, God didn't say that he you still have free will to choose between good and evil, but he didn't say free will should extend the hand and protect other people who worship false gods. Well, we asked for it. Verse 19. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time and making war against it to take it, thou shalt destroy the trees thereof by for thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them. And thou shalt not cut down the tree, uh, thou shalt not cut down I'm sorry, let me start this over. When thou shalt besiege a city a long time and making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them, and thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is a man's life to employ them in a siege. In other words, God says, babe, be smart. Don't just carelessly and recklessly destroy everything. In a, in a war. Be strategic. You know, if you're surrounding a city, hey, don't just cut down all those trees and fruit trees. Uh, um, use them for your food, for sustenance. While you're, uh, while you're um, you know, encircling the city for a long time there. Verse 20. Only the trees which thou mayest, um, which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat. They're not fruit trees. They're, they're not... Um, trees that can give you uh, syrup and things like that. Thou shalt not destroy, thou shalt uh, destroy and cut them down and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city 
that maketh war against thee until it be subdued. Now, again, God says you can use the other trees that aren't good. You can use oak trees and things like that um, to use to make battlements, to, you know, different tools to get you up into the city, to catapult you in or whatever, uh, ramps and so forth. But but don't cut down the fruit trees. Keep those things that, that'll give you a subsidence um, um, during that time. But I cannot help but think of Mystery Babylon when we're talking about a city and encircling a city. Because in a sense, that is who we are fighting today. That's the city we are up against. It's Mystery Babylon the Great of Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And it's the city the harlot city that we are going to have the victory over. And we are circling and surrounding it with the truth right now. And we are building our way up to it. And we will achieve the victory. So, hey, fascinating chapter. God's law is so beautiful. Like I always said, hey, if you don't understand God's law, there's no way you'll be able to understand prophecy. For prophecy is the fulfillment of different legal things, legalities in God's law. Blessings, cursings, um, how God wages war even. Because God follows his own laws. And when you get to the book of Revelation, you see that. He gives people a chance to repent. He holds out the olive branch before raining down his judgment. So again, the law especially most notably the book of Deuteronomy is the key to understanding the entire Bible. And it is a beautiful thing. Hey, I hope you enjoyed those, those, um, these laws of warfare. Hey, and again, in, I think it is in, um, if you want to get a little bit more in-depth study on it, um, this warfare in a spiritual sense, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Paul tells Timothy to... Um, um, to not be, if you're, a, if you're a soldier for Jesus Christ, don't get entangled in the affairs of this life. Be focused. Be motivated. And be willing to stand up for the truth at whatever cost. Because we are going to pay a severe price for being a cr Christian. We're going we're gonna to experience ridicule, mocking. Um, some people will even pay with their lives as is recorded in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, 4 through 6, I believe. Um, so we must, we must follow these, these uh, apply these principles of warfare to our spiritual fight as well. But hey, I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Um, do like Christ says in Matthew chapter 4, when tempted of the devil, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So see that you partake of it. See that you consume it. Digest it. Meditate upon it on a daily basis so that you can be a Christian overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you and thank you for your support.